Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Everyday Trader. This is Greg. Good to be back with you after a little bit of a hiatus. No, it's summertime, fall, early fall. Yeah, today's uh, September 13th. The weather's a little bit cooler. I think we've got a high of 71 today in Chicagoland. And, Dad, I closed my blinds, so there's no no there you go. behind my head here. <laughs> so feedback I get from my dad is, hey, uh, you <laughs> it's always about the glow. So uh, the yeah the, the 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 big news in the world of the market today is of course the latest release of our CPI report um and the story about inflation and that inflation is accelerating. It's interesting to see the comments uh on uh, you know mainstream media today as I was Driving around this morning, I was toggling back and forth between CNBC and Bloomberg. And, you know, CNBC, of course, likes to talk about the headline and how it affects consumers and things are more expensive. Uh, Bloomberg always seems to be more of an economist's viewpoint rather than a retailer's viewpoint. And so it was interesting seeing the the economist side. Um, and, and there was still a discussion going back and forth between uh, you know, Tom Keene calling this a nothing burger and yet Mike McKee saying that, well, actually, you know, the concern is that we are starting to see some increases again, particularly in the price of gasoline that can reaccelerate inflation. And, and obviously in, in the comments that Mike made this morning, where it's very likely that the Fed has already decided what they're doing this meeting. This I don't think this CPI report is going to change the Fed's decision on uh, where their action is this month, but it very likely will leave another dot on the dot plot for a potential another increase still later this year. And so it's interesting the differences there. Um, I'm I'm of the opinion that this inflation report is not a nothing burger uh, because I, I think I agree with McKee that I think that if we see a reacceleration in energy, um, in energy prices, that's going to have a trickle effect just like it did last time. And I'm not saying that the, the spike in oil prices that we had two years ago is the only thing that drove inflation. We know that's not the case, but there's still a lot of liquidity in the system and a lot of money to chase things. And if things start to reaccelerate, it could create a problem. So um, the market today doesn't seem to care. We seem to be rallying on the on the news. Uh, maybe it's a Goldilocks scenario for the markets, but I don't know. What are your thoughts on the, the CPI data today? I know you've had a chance to to dig in and, and look at some of the nitty gritty, and I'm interested to hear that. Yeah, certainly. I think it, you nailed um, nailed the my thoughts exactly. Um, there, there was definitely you know we saw a notable increase in looking at you know the charts that that we're hoping to see inflation come down to this two level. And if we look at the overall number, you know we're up at three point seven. We had a little bit of a dip up last time, and we we're going up. I don't. This wasn't totally unexpected. And the CPI number, of course, if you dive into it, and you know that I do um, peel apart the data, uh, and that's probably the best thing to do is to jump in and look at um, the spreadsheet. So you've got everything from rice and pasta to bananas and gasoline and laundry and men's footwear. And I mean, there's this huge list of things that gets rolled in. And this is the... This is the CPI uh, number six table, which is available from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. If you uh, just go over to the bls.gov and then find CPI, you can download these tables. And I'm happy to share them with anybody who's interested. I, I take these and put them in and and then slice and dice the data and, and look at it sort of by major categories. This is level four for those that are interested. So this is this list is sorted by importance. So the the light grayish blue bar is the importance weighting in the CPI. So there's 
hundreds of items that are in here. And the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, uh, gives an importance weighting to each one of these. And so here we have the most important high-level categories, level four categories. So rent of shelter, you hear this talked about, which does include home prices as well. This is a way of looking at what you're spending for your domicile, where you sleep. And we've seen increases across the board. Nothing's gone negative over here. Everything is positive and maybe the numbers are small. The big one that jumps out, of course, here, gasoline up 10.6%. This is a month over month. And we can see some things that are going down over here. And as we scroll down to less important stuff, um, there's other numbers. So there's another way to, to look at this too. And I think you can... You can look at the data and sort of make a hypothesis. And you know what's the what's the story that's coming out of this? Uh, here's a list of the same items, just sort of by what increased the most. We got other motor oil fuels, so that's um, that would be you probably diesel fuel putting in your truck, gasoline, fuel oil for heating, other transportation services, which. Transportation services, which is all affected, obviously, by the fuel cost, propane, kerosene, firewood, uh, and then people who don't drive, sneaker prices, <laughs> so footwear going up. Um, but certainly the narrative here is around oil, around crude oil and fuel prices and the impact that that's having. Now, where, where does this go from here? I, I think we can... You know, we, we've all seen the headlines and what's on the CPI. I guess the the first thing that I want to talk about, and let's get this out of the way, is this doesn't matter. And here is the the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Fed Watch tools, and this is based on Fed future uh, Fed futures. So the future Fed fund rate futures. A lot of the F's in that uh, in that statement there, but this takes an estimate of whether or not the Fed will be raising rates or not. And the highest category is actually, we're, right now we're at 525 to 550. So there is a 54 based on these numbers. And I, I think they, you got to take these numbers with a grain of salt, but right now um, the shift is um, that we're, it actually shifted up a little bit because yesterday this was 55 and it's gone down a little bit. So there's a little bit of a shift, I think, because inflation was just a little bit hotter than was anticipated. Not very hot, but I think this oil thing's got a lot of people um, looking at it. So what I look for is really the changes here. When I come to this, this CME thing, it's not so much about you know how accurate are these probabilities because I don't think they're even close and to how they play out, but it's how did they move? And things definitely shifted more towards a, a, a pause. You don't see any, any rate cut here by the end of the year. And if we click on probabilities, we can see, so we're at this 525 to 550 range. There isn't a rate cut forecasted until June. Uh, I mean, the, it's not even forecasted. It's just saying that the highest probability um, is that category. So we're looking at you know, another nine months of this uh, higher for longer sort of situation. I personally, and if you look at these numbers too, of, a, of an increase, they're not non-zero. There's, if we get to the end of the year, there's there's a potential for, for us raising rates. I'm in the camp that, that we're going to raise rates one more time. It's just a gut feel. And it's based on this sort of thing that we're not seeing inflation go down. If we get another number up, um, Waller was on CNBC, Chris Waller, Fed president, or uh, Fed governor Waller. He's he's definitely on the hawkish side of things. And he said, listen, we can't make any decisions. We're going to wait for the data. And that's all that that the best that we can do. Um, Nick, we joke around about Nick Timmerhaus being this, um, the the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he's had several pieces out this week and basically said, Fed's not raising rates next week. So I I bet with my money on Tim, uh, so I, I mean, sorry, on Nick Timmerhaus, uh, I put my money on him. I, I don't think we're going to have a rate increase. I would bet a significant amount of money that the Fed uh, holds things, but we have to see how the rest of the year plays out. So before we transition to oil and gas, any, any thoughts on this or the Fed? Well, the one question I have about that you know you said the higher for longer um i still and i've said this in our, some of our past recordings i'm still of the opinion that 
I think a disconnect that's happening in the S&P 500 right now, and probably especially in the higher valuation tech stocks, is that there's this expectation that you threw out that we're not going to start pricing in rate cuts until June now. And if you remember three or four months ago, that those rate cuts were supposed to happen by the end of the year this year. Yeah, we would so, already be, we'd be doing them right now. <laughs> we were supposed to be cutting rates and we're not. We're still talking about raising rates. And I think the risk that's not priced into the market right now is this idea that the terminal rate, I think I agree with you. I don't know if we're going much higher where our current term, at least I hope we're not. Um, I, I think quarter of a point, maybe two more increases. I don't know that that really matters one versus two at this point. Um, I think the unknown that's not priced into the market is how much, how long we stay at that terminal rate and whether that could start to impact, I think, particularly the prices of corporate bonds that right now are going to eventually have to reprice and they're going to have to go reborrow money again. And if we don't see rates start to come down, that's going to have a serious impact on corporate profitability. And it'll be interesting to hear as we, start listening to more and more conference calls, particularly those companies that are having to use leverage, that are using the bond market to raise money, uh, how how that's impacting their profit margins as they're having to refinance their, their uh, debt levels at higher rates because that's where they are in the market. Uh, I don't think that's priced into the market yet, personally, and priced into the equity prices. And it could be an imbalance uh, if we stay at the, this higher terminal rate for nine months or a year or two years. Who knows before, to be honest, how long we're going to have to stay at these rates to really control inflation. Because you're right, the 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 inflation is still pretty sticky. Yes, it's slowed down and it's going in the right direction, which is great. But if you look at the one that really matters to the Fed, the core PCE, not the CPI, that one's actually coming down much slower. It's still coming down. So it's going in the right direction, but it's still pretty sticky. So I think I agree with you. I'm, I'm Waller wields a pretty big hammer in the Fed and the decision process for the Fed. So I'm well, going to have to- I wanted to touch base that the Fed makeup is changing and the, there are no vacant seats now. So the last one was filled uh, today or yesterday. Um, by the way, the, the person who- uh, took the place is uh, um, from Berkeley uh, was um, uh, mentored by George George Akerlof, who's um, Janet Yellen's husband. Uh, so we can, if we try to guess what the politics are going to be of this new person, or not, I shouldn't say politics, but um, what the sort of economic view is, we, we're going to get a sort of another MIT um person a, a lot like a probably like a janet yellen uh, i.e we're probably gonna get a dove uh on the board so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out but what i wanted to go back to and talk about and just the fed keeping the rates elevated is not the fed doing nothing so this this number is is a deceleration force this uh this rate the fed funds rate is putting the brakes on and not pressing harder is still pressing on the brakes. So the brakes are pressed on pretty hard. And the intent holding the rates here is a persistent because we are above this. People talk about this R star, this natural rate of inflation with the pressure from the Fed being higher than this natural rate. It should slow things down. That's the theory um, that the, the Fed is trying to accomplish is to slow down the economy. Um, you made a comment about it affecting fundamentals, and this is a point for, you know, okay, so what? Why are we talking about this? Why are we here? One of the key points is that um, companies that have higher debt are going to have more of a challenge of making their bottom line. Um, they This is going to affect their margins as they have to pay more money to service their debt. However, I read a piece this week that showed that cat companies with a strong balance sheet and low debt tend to do better. Um, part of the reason is because they're able to pass along, and we've seen this happen, they're able to pass along uh, higher interest rates. Some of the work done by Sam Rimes has been fantastic, where he has really been out ahead, showing that companies are able to either 
increase their price or reduce the volume of the products and keep the price the same and been able to pr pass along price and margin. Uh, these are some things that you'll read about and see in his newsletters. And he's this is what's happening in this environment. So there's certain companies that I think are going to do very well. And you think about companies with strong balance sheets, um, you know, Apple comes to mind. And I think let's talk about Apple after we finish this logical progression of, of the CPI and what it's being driven by is inflation, is oil prices. Um, sound like a good transition to you? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's one of the reasons why I have always, as part of my fundamental due diligence, like to find companies that are growing earnings, that have earnings, have you know positive net cash flow, and don't carry a significant amount of debt. We the, the last fifteen years in our economy has made a lot of companies lazy and arguably you know way too risk tolerant as a company and they've gone out and borrowed money because it's been zero interest rate. Uh, the perfect example of that this year was early this year <clears throat> with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. That's a bank that got lazy because of the past 15 years of how monetary policy has been handled. They didn't account for the idea that yes, the Fed's actually going to keep raising rates because in the past they've just had rates at zero and gotten used to it. There may be companies out there that are still making this assumption, the Fed's going to go back to zero. They're going to start cutting. That's a risk. That's a fundamental risk. And if if you're doing your due diligence on a company, I think right now it's pretty important to look for companies with pretty low levels of debt that aren't going to be exposed to that problem that we both just talked about. Excellent. Yeah, I agree. And there are some companies that 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 do have very strong balance sheets. And then, you know, putting together this narrative of what's happening, um, especially around oil. So this this chart has been making its way around. This is the the volume of the strategic petroleum reserve. And we've talked about this before on the podcast. We, you and I have both had an opportunity to talk to um <laughs> You remember my story of the guy who used to run the SBR. I was fishing with him once at Camp Kotak and uh, I was making some statements. And he said, I don't think that's true. Uh, I, I said, I'm not sure about this or that. He goes, well, I'm pretty sure about it. And I was like, How do, are you sure? He's like, I, I used to run the SBR. So, oh, okay. So right now we've got this shocking chart. If you go back to the 80s, we're at these 80s levels on the SPR. And let me, first of all, it's, it's easy to become uh, sort of hyperbolic about what's happening here and, and panic by this certainly does look like a reason to panic, but we're also an we are an, a net producer of oil. So we produce more oil that we use than we export. And that wasn't the case back in the 70s and in, in the 80s when we needed to create the SPR. Um, I mean, there's this, you know, this 40, we only have 46 days worth of oil reserves in this emergency supply and it's going down. And this was this reserve was taken out to help. Help inflation. That's exactly why we did it to try and keep oil prices down. Um, you know, it, it's probably bad, but probably not as bad as it sounds on the headline. But it is significant um, that that we're getting to low levels, and there's certainly a point where we can't dump more oil onto the market. We've got OPEC and OPEC plus companies out there ratcheting back supply, and if we you look at the Department of Energy's most recent forecast. Um, they have crude forecasted at, to be at ninety three dollars a barrel. This is a short term forecast, and in August the average was eighty six. So they're looking the last half of the year. They're forecasting oil. They have this sort of well, where's this graph? Uh, this confidence ban of where they think uh, oil um, will be uh, in 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 the outlook. So they've got this sort of dot plot of it's going to be somewhere in this range and they've got this thing going up and then coming down because there's seasonality that happens and whatnot. But the the forecast is for higher prices of, of oil. And how does that play out? So for you people listening, one thing for sure, I think we're going to see inflation continue to have pressure to the upside. So next quarter, if we see oil at 93 a barrel next month um, or continue to stay higher, watch those gas prices, the fuel prices going up, it's going to play out and we're likely to see another high print on uh, CPI. And, and it'll probably impact PCE as well, as far as inflation goes. But what does this mean? 
um, in terms of us and making decisions about what we trade. And I think there's a couple opportunities that that jump out here for me. Um, the first is I, I, oil companies like Exxon and um, one of your recent favorite and Uncle Warren's recent favorites, Occidental Petroleum, ConocoPhillips. I know you trade ConocoPhillips. What, what are your thoughts about how this plays out for them? I think you can choose any one of them and do well. I think I think you're right. I think Occidental is my personal favorite. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that Warren is a buyer behind it as well. I don't know that they're necessarily the, the best position profitability-wise. I actually think ConocoPhillips may be uh, the best one right now. But they're all good. Chevron. Uh, Chevron Texaco is, is a great one. There's a lot of the smaller names as well. And it, because, yes, I do believe there is both an opportunity to play the oil names. Um, I, I don't necessarily. And again, for me, I don't trade the actual commodity um, oil. You can, but I don't. Um, I actually don't recommend me personally. I don't like to even trade USO, uh, the ETF that, that tracks that because it's of, of issues you if you want a, a lesson in how risky trading uso can be go back to uh the pandemic um and how uso actually went negative um for a while and just as that. an aside the uso doesn't trade oil spot oil it trades three strips of future oil prices so um and it's actually uso went negative during covid so you yeah. can, equities theoretically can't go negative and the uso did also not to mention that it's a limited partnership it's not so you will even in an, in an ira talk to your tax accounts i'm not giving tax advice i'm not providing any tax information here but you might have to pay taxes on something that you make money on in an ira account where you think it's tax free but what I found with the USO is it, it tends to move up with oil, but doesn't come down when oil goes down. Or, or is it the other way around? I, I, it doesn't always move the same way as you'd expect because yeah. it's not actually spot oil. It's the futures. And I agree with you. I think a much better way to play this is with one of the oil companies that are out there. And look at look at ExxonMobil with a PE of 9.23. Um, you know, we're, we're knocking on the door here of getting into 52 week highs. Um, I would bet the pressure, you know, the trend is your friend here on any one of these, whichever one you want to play, whether it's Chevron or Exxon Mobil. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of, tr of trading oil companies. I have a different approach here uh, before we trade. And you know what I'm going to talk about. So I do. And I'm going to let you, I'm not going to take your thunder either. So any <laughs> other thoughts on trading oil and oil companies? Um, there's another way to do it. I, I love trading oil companies. I think they're fantastic. The, the other thing I'll throw in there, not only do they trade at pretty low PEs, if you actually own the shares and don't just do straight option trades, they pay most, for the most part, pretty healthy dividend yields as well. So if you're looking for stocks to do like covered calls on that also pay a nice dividend yield, oil companies are great names. You know what? Um, this is maybe in the middle. You and I didn't talk about it. Has anybody, have you seen this Wall Street Journal article going around about option trading gamblers? No. Uh, yeah, Brando. Uh, oh, do you know what? I did see Brando tweeted yeah. it, but I haven't. Yeah. Oh, you know, he sent us an article. email um, and copied yeah. the Wall Street Journal reporter wrote this piece. Um, and the article is talking about these zero day option traders and and the the person that gets interviewed is sort of featured in the article is a retail trader who plays poker professionally and he's clearly a gambler um in my opinion the these well it's not my opinion the one day zero day options were created um well because people asked for them but the people who are asking for them are institutions and it's a function of uh the way that the option market works is that op market makers dealers will have some asset, um, normally uh, the underlying equity or a future, uh, to counterbalance the risk that they have when they're selling individual options. They're selling options on Apple and ExxonMobil and GM and Ford and all these other companies. They can go out and buy the stock of those companies. What they'll often do is go out and buy um, futures because the futures, like the S&P 500 futures, are very liquid and they have a, a decent, um, they're a good proxy for what those market maker dealers have in their portfolios. And so they're doing this all day long, buying in, in increments of stock. Well, what's happened now is they've switched 
because of the interest rates being higher, there's a benefit for them to use SPX options. So these zero day options, because they don't hold them overnight, they don't have to pay interest on them. And there is a risk associated with using zero day options in this capacity. But the, the evidence is showing by and large, it's it's the virtues and the capitals and the, uh, um, sorry, Virtu and um, what's Ken Griffin's company? The the other uh, big yeah, market uh, on there. Yeah, not uh, not night not night capital. It's uh, it'll come to me. Doesn't matter for for retail traders. We don't we don't do this. This is this is like how asking what time it is, and I explain how a watch works. How does market making work? Um, it, it's not for retail traders. Can't do it. It's, but it's but it's somewhat interesting. It does. It is worth noting, but certainly this huge spike in zero day options has retail traders really, really attractive to the bright and shiny thing. And it's no surprise to me that somebody who plays in the World Series of Poker um, also wants to gamble, you know, seventy thousand dollars a day in one day options. Uh, but it's not mostly retail traders that are trading it. Retail traders are jumping on it, and you know, if you want to gamble, that's certainly. Fine. It's um, there are, but there are people that are around you. I always tell people who are who are teaching people how to trade options um, that that there's somebody that's sitting next to you that's in this for fun and and gambling, and they do things for different reasons. Greg and I firmly believe that options are provided to help you mitigate risk and take advantage of opportunities. And we strongly believe in hedging, defining your risk and putting probabilities on your side. And there are strategies that, you know, we've got decades of experience to show that it works. It's no surprise to me that this Wall Street Journal article comes out and says most retail traders lose money in options. That's not a surprise to us. In fact, the data I've seen, most stock individual stock investors lose money when they pick stocks because they move around too much. They tend to pick something when it's at its high. So I, I thought that article was interesting, um, but I, I think it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. You, you can't uh, sort of criticize all option traders, all retail option traders, because there's a few people out there that gamble. Citadel. Citadel. <laughs> Griffin. So yeah, uh, they're, those, them and the other market makers are the ones that are out there trading most of the SPX options. And it's available to anybody to trade, but it certainly reminds me of the VIX um, sort of market that happened a few years ago where people are trading these ETNs, ETF um, or exchange traded notes that were trading VIX futures and they just exploded overnight. Um, the zero day option thing scares me, but that's not where we were here. Uh, we talked about, we've, we've gone through this lo sort of logical progression of today's discussion going from CPI, um, where do we think FUD futures funds rates are gonna be, impact of oil. Um, I, I think there's some benefit. I think there's some opportunity here. And Greg had mentioned some of the oil companies, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, uh, Occidental Petroleum. My favorite that benefits from rising oil prices is a certain electric car company. Tesla. So wants to go to the moon one day. So there is uh, a... Tesla normally does really well when oil gets above five dollars a gallon. It's people start start doing the math and it makes a lot of sense. Especially seeing is I don't know when you go to Tesla's website, if you price a car out, they the price they display factors in the the gas savings. So with the price of the gas going up, you'll see a retail price that's really going to go lower as the price of gas goes up. It's it's a little cheesy. I don't really like them doing that. Uh, but it does force people to do the math. If you look at the total cost of ownership, um, Tesla's are, you know, my, a, a friend of mine came out to visit and he was driving my Tesla. He's like, wow, I've never been in one of these before. This is, this is really cool. It does this, it does that. And this, well, it's, it's much more expensive, isn't it? I said, no, it's not Do the math. And he, he just emailed me on Monday and said, wow, my, I think my wife's going to buy one now. You should get a commission. So I said, here, use my referral code and, and you'll save some money and I'll save some money. So I think Tesla's um, really in a position right now for several different reasons. One, um, they're about, there's a lot of catalysts coming out. There's the Cybertruck, which is due out anytime. We've got, um, there's rumors of the two, whatever this new cheap 
product is going to be made. Uh, allegedly, this is going to be made in Austin. So we'll probably start seeing more uh, details leaking about that one. But gas prices um, going up is is something that is a catalyst, a positive catalyst for Tesla. So I'm bullish. Also wanted to throw in this piece by uh, Morgan Stanley was published this week. If you haven't seen this all right, already, there's some news stories out there. So Adam Jonas has listed Tesla as the, his top pick uh, with a $400 price target, talking about this thing, Dojo, which is really how Tesla is using AI to make the um, the autopilot um, is it autopilot full self-driving um, much better. That's, and if you've never experienced full self-driving, find a friend who has it in their car and, and go for a ride in it because it is way better than it used to be. And when people are in my car and I'm driving on self, they're like, wait a minute, is the car driving itself right now? It's like, yep. It, it's pretty damn good. It's pretty damn good. So I, I think there's a lot of catalysts there. Um, I'm still, you know, Tesla is a company that moves around quite a bit. So you definitely want to be hedged, but I have been trading actually covered calls uh, is the strategy that I'm using right now on, on Tesla. It's a great trade. I think the one thing I'll throw out there um, as far as, uh, and I always have to end on being a, the cautious pessimist of the group. Um, the the disconnect between retail and what the Fed is doing, I think is to me still a major concern. I, I, I'm bullish in the market on the short term. I think there's an opportunity for us to get a, probably a pretty good rally at the end of the year uh, in some names after this pullback that we had both in, in, in August and then September's not been uh, great either. I know we've been a lot more choppy, but I think there's some opportunity to be bullish at the end of the year, but then I'm concerned next year, we're going to start to see some of these fundamental impacts of the potential pickup back in inflation. If this, if this is, isn't just a one-off report, maybe inflation rolls back over again, but if we start to see energy prices continue to ratchet up and the idea that we're going to be higher for longer, especially as we listen to the Fed next week, talk about the, their length of keeping their rates higher, I think it creates a disconnect for next year. So, uh, which will be interesting in an election year um, as well, because we also have that drama coming up soon. So should be should create some great trading opportunities. I'd be cautious of just being like, uber bullish right now saying that things are just going going up and that we've fixed all of our issues awesome so before we wrap up greg one more thing okay what do you got Apple. Uh, <laughs> man how did i set that i just set that i just teed that up didn't i that was great for those of you that don't know, Steve Jobs used to, um, he, he did this four or five times where he went through a product rollout and then the end he says, one more thing. And that was always the big thing. Um, and so I, we had the big thing uh, yesterday with Apple rolling out um, new iPhones, new um, Apple watches, upgrades across the board there, some changes to the AirPod lineup, but some mentions about, um, you know, future laptops. I think in October, we're going to get an, a laptop rollout, maybe some iPad rollouts, but the big news was this new iPhone uh, 15, which is got some incremental features. It's not really game changing. There's a, a new action button. The, the case is made out of titanium. It's lighter. I think the big news, though, is the price didn't go up. And that was a little bit of a surprise. It was expected that Apple would be raising prices. Uh, for me, this isn't necessarily a good thing for Apple from a fundamental standpoint. Uh, Apple uh, obviously has a higher cost uh, the, oh, the other big thing is the transition to the USB-C plug. So they're getting away from the lightning plug. So all of you that have your lightning uh, cord adapters, guess what? You get to buy brand new uh, USB-C plugs. Um, hooray. <laughs> but it, it I'm be actually awesome. glad that they're finally doing that, to be honest. I mean, it's USB-C is universal. I mean, it, you're going to be able to use it on multiple devices now instead of just being 
your Apple has its own unique. You're charger. brainwashed, Greg. I know. I know. I'm kidding. I'm not. I'm with you too. I actually don't mind it. I I really like the USB C plugs. I have some accessories. The U USB C. You plug them in either way. They they work really nicely. Um, and they they're fast and the smooth data connection. So I'm actually okay with it. But it is going to cost me, you know, probably a few hundred dollars in accessories here. Which and that's where Apple makes a ton of money. But what were your thoughts uh, overall on the on the iPhone announcements? Or the- you know, I was I'm probably the same with you. Nothing game changing. The fundamentals may be challenged with they're not, not increasing prices. Um, however, you know, going back to our earlier discussion, Apple's one of those companies because of their strong cash position, um, because of their balance sheet that isn't really going to be exposed to a risk of uh, higher costs of having to borrow money to operate. Now that's not to say that Apple hasn't gone and done bonds in the past and they don't, and that they have zero debt, but it was only because it was zero interest rate. And that was basically free money for them that they went and did that. They're not one of those companies that when those bonds mature and they have to, you know, all that, all that, that cash is gone, uh, they have to go get more money to continue to operate their business. So I actually think Apple's in a still a pretty strong fundamental position. I like that they've pulled back um, after their last earnings report and the fear that happened in August and September. So, you know, at 175, do I think they could go lower? Maybe a little bit, but I'm actually starting to, you know, would, would consider nibbling back into Apple right now. I've been out since actually midsummer, I have not had an Apple position at all. Really? Other than, wow. other than I have a, I have a framed share of Apple that's sitting I've on my yeah, in my office. That. Other well, than that, I'm actually have, not even for right now. I happen to think Apple's worth about 150 a share fundamentally based on yeah. historical analysis. So if I, I've been doing, I do a discounted cash flow analysis, Warren Buffett style. Uh, and download you know their financials and, and run the numbers myself. And if we apply a traditional, and I mean going back you know 10, 15 years, um, uh, that sort of evaluation, you know, Apple you know is trading right around. <laughs> I guess right now it's uh, two point seven trillion dollars. Um, it, it, it's difficult to you know call that a you know a, a high growth um, sort of tech company, but they are. Um, and, and there's a lot of hope for them, especially in their services, which was, has been over the past two years, affording them a much higher multiple. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a trader of Apple, but, um, I actually, this week I shared a trade with people in the trader oasis community, actually the options animal community too. The monthly trade was a bearish trade because Apple almost always goes down after product announcements because no matter what they announce no matter how awesome it is, there's always press stories about how they're, um, you know, it's, the headlines are written ahead of time. So I, I could have told you what it was going to be. And that is that um, Apple didn't release this feature and it's only an incremental change and it's only slightly better. Uh, you know, there's no big step changes. And it's kind of hard, I think, to come up with some new revolutionary technology with such a mature uh, product like the iPhone. And, uh, you know, we'll see when they, when Apple Vision comes out, how that goes. I'm still not a believer. I've got my box. I, you know, it's been probably nine months since I've opened up my, uh, my what's the the meta virtual? Oculus? Uh, my Oculus, yeah. I don't, yeah. I really don't see myself strapping on a, one that has Apple, especially if it's going to be 3000 bucks. So, you know, I do, normally after the product announcements, Apple goes higher. So sort of re-summarizing here, I, you know, over the past couple of years, I'm given. You mean lower? You said they go lower. No, I think they go higher. You think they go higher? I, I I think they do uh, go higher from here. I think fundamental. Personally, my fundamental value is 150, but fundamentals are are like gravity. So people will come up with a fundamental price and say this is. I think there's always a draw to that price. Uh, and it's based on my assumptions. Value is is beauty. It's only what you think it's worth. Right now, the market has been giving Apple uh, a higher multiple. So the traditional multiple doesn't apply. And based on some a newsletter that I read, there's that you know, Apple normally goes down on a product announcement, but three months later, it's usually higher. 
So I, I do think once uh, the products start shipping and start getting out there and we start getting the YouTube videos of the people and people seeing them in the wild, I, I think Apple will get some traction. Part of the reason is they kept the price the same. I'm, um, I've am i got an iPhone 14. I, I can upgrade for, for $5 a month to the 15. It's almost worth doing for five bucks a month. Uh, and that's the way most people are are getting their phones is through a monthly payment. And so I've heard so many people that have, you know, an iPhone 13 or a 12. I, I expect that we're going to see a lot of people upgrading here uh, to the iPhones and the other products as well. I think the new ultra is, is compelling. If you don't already have an ultra, the watch I'm talking about, there's reason to get one. I'm seriously, it's going to be on my Christmas list. So I'll probably get one for Christmas. But um, but right now, Apple's being afforded this higher multiple. And I said, my, so my my higher multiple puts it closer to 200 if you used the current multiple that the market is giving it. So, you know, there's this range of where do I think it can go? I think 150 to 200. And, and right now, I think this is probably a buying opportunity for people. I do think um, I think Apple will probably be higher three months from now, but it but it might be choppy between now and then that's. Uh, you know, I I know that I'm providing uh, sort of both arguments here, but th but that's that's what I think. Um, I think we'll probably see more pressure. I'm overall bullish on Apple um, from here. Uh, once now that we have this product cycle behind us, it's a uh, you know in a typical bullish year, which we've had this year. Um, you know, Apple does have this pattern that you just talked about. Is they'll have these bullish runs through the summer. The fall tends to be choppy for them uh at best they they have you know and, and a lot of it's with their product cycle reduced but september october tends to be choppy for apple sometimes you see some bearish pressure which then creates some great buying opportunities as typically people uh i think it's a lot of this is driven by retail demand for apple shares is they think about oh i'm gonna go buy apple products for my kids and my wife and my family and then they think well if everybody's out buying these Apple products, it's probably going to be a good thing for Apple shares. So I'm going to buy Apple shares too. And so you see this holiday year end shopping mentality of investing in Apple as well. And it's usually a pretty good trade Q4 to, to look at going bullish at the end of the you know Q3 in anticipation of a run into Q4. But yeah, I think between now and the end of October, Apple could still have a lot of chop. It'll be interesting to see if 175 can hold. It's got some pretty good support there. Yeah. I, and to be honest, I don't know that I'm not advocating any, first of all, we're not providing any trading advice, do your own due diligence, uh, but I would not be a straight out share buyer of Apple here. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily say go buy shares of Apple, but I think using either shares and options or an option based strategy gives you you know high probability of uh, making money and you can hedge yourself if you do get a sort of move and it's so uh, there's some wonderful setups if you're if you use option trades um to manage your risk here and um potentially take advantage of the sort of um move that i think is going to happen again we're not well, was, trading advice at all that was a good that was a good one more thing i liked it i like the steve jobs <laughs> All right. Well, that this is uh, another everyday trader in the can. Uh, hopefully, you folks are liking this. We we got a notice from uh, YouTube that we are now officially a YouTube partner because of you, uh, you people watching and listening and liking and sharing. Feel free to please uh, leave comments and thumbs up, subscribe, and tell your friends. Say, hey, listen, these guys. If if you like what we've got here, you know, feel you'd be helping us out if you if you shared it with people. And um, we certainly appreciate all of you listeners in our community and look forward to seeing you in the future real soon. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Right. Nope. See you at the next one. Thanks, Eric.